It is my great honor to open and chair the Belmarsh Tribunal here at Church House, at the center, at the heart of Westminster, at a place where the meetings of the Parliament of the United Kingdom were being held during World War II, and also a place where the first meeting of the UN Security Council was held. But we are not only in London today. We are everywhere in the world, not only thanks to the internet, but also thanks to millions who are ready to fight injustice and demand justice. What and whom are we putting on trial? The bloody crimes that have been committed by Western governments, the United States, but also the United Kingdom, Australia, Sweden, Ecuador under Lenin Moreno, and other governments, the CIA, the NSA, and the military industrial complex. From war crimes to crimes against journalism and civilians, and crimes against publishers like Julian Assange. We are here so that torture, secret killings, rendition, surveillance, character assassination, and real assassination won't be forgotten and will be put on trial. To whom are we presenting this investigation? As Bertrand Russell said, answering the same question about the Russell Sartre Tribunal, we are presenting it to the conscience of humankind. And today we should add, we are presenting it to all the women and men, mothers and fathers, children and future lawyers, current politicians and journalists, judges, and all those who will come in our wake. What do we expect of this tribunal today? We came to London in time of disorder. We came to London in time of turmoil, and we are presenting our evidence and accusations to you and to those who shall resurface following the flood in which we might perish. We know very well no tribunal can bring justice to the victims of war crimes. I incidentally come from a country which went through a bloody war after the collapse of Yugoslavia. Yes, there was the International Criminal Tribunal for the former of Yugoslavia at The Hague, and of course its rulings brought some satisfaction to the families of the victims. But it is enough to come to ex-Yugoslavia to see former war criminals being successful businessmen. Well, you don't have to go to ex-Yugoslavia. You can come to the United Kingdom and find Tony Blair. Or you can go to the United States and you will find plenty of them, war criminals who have never been put on trial. So what do we expect of the tribunal today? Our position is strong because we do not seek to send a few individuals to prison, Jean-Paul Sartre said of the Russell Sartre Tribunal, but to reawaken in public opinion at an ominous moment of our history the idea that there can be policies which are objectively and legally criminal. Now imagine a capital city in Western Europe, in the heart of so-called Western civilization, whatever this means. You probably remember Walter Benjamin who said that every document of civilization is a document of barbarism. Imagine a journalist who was for seven years entrapped in an embassy of a country that was friendly to him. But times changed and he became an enemy to almost every country. For what? For speaking the truth and revealing the dirty and monstrous crimes of the military industrial complex. Then he was put in a high security prison together with terrorists and fundamentalists. And then it was revealed that another country, not Saudi Arabia or Russia, but the United States of America, would kidnap him or kill him at the soil of that capital just opposite to Herod's, yes, here in London. And still, a British court is still deciding whether to extradite this journalist precisely to the United States, and this is nothing more but assassination in broad daylight. So, since the Russell Sartre Tribunal was started by philosophers, and I happen to be one, as distasteful as it is to describe oneself as a philosopher, uh, you will allow me a philosophical reference. All of you here, and I'm sure the judges who are watching us, who will decide on Julian Assange's fate, will remember the Apology of Socrates, written by Plato in 399 BC. What was Socrates charged of? There were two charges. The first charge was that he was corrupting the youth. And the second charge was the charge of Asibia, of not believing in the gods of Athens. He could have escaped, 
just like Julian Assange, but he didn't, and the jury condemned him to death. So what does Socrates say at the moment when he's being accused that he's corrupting the youth and not believing in the gods of the Parthenon? He says the following sentence. This is my first appearance in court of law at the age of 70. Well, not many could say that. And so I am a complete foreigner to the language of this place. And I think this is a very important sentence. He asked the Athenian judges, whom he sometimes calls the Athenians, to treat him like a foreigner, like a Xenos. Uh, the great French linguist Emile Benveniste reminded us uh, that Xenos would later in Latin become hostis. This is also the source of the English word hostile, while in the original ancient Greek meaning, it meant at the same time foreigner and guest, someone who still had some rights, and it was also the right of hospitality. So Socrates has, says that he is not even treated as a foreigner, as a xenos. In front of the nomos, the law, he was treated as an enemy, as hostis. Julian Assange, together with Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Hale, and many other courageous truth-tellers, finds himself in the most respectable company of Socrates. And it is not just Socrates who was accused of Asibia. The, the list is long. Eschylus, Anaxagoras, Aspasia, Aristotle who fled before the trial, and Protagoras who was sentenced to death or exile. So if the British judges decide either to extradite Assange to the US or to keep him in the British Guantanamo, they will basically condemn him to death. To conclude and to launch, and it's my great honor to launch the Belmar Tribunal today, let me quote the great German playwright Bertolt Brecht, who said, sad is the country which needs heroes. Today we should say, sad is the world that needs Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Hale, Julian Assange, and so many courageous publishers and whistleblowers. It is sad because it means something is deeply wrong with our world, but we are lucky to have them. So, without further introduction, let me invite our first speaker, my dear friend and original member of the Bertrand Russell Tribunal, Tariq Ali. <clears throat> um, thank you, Stre uh, Strechko. Um, the Bertrand Russell Jean-Paul Sartre War Crimes Tribunal was set up because the two philosophers publicly stated that the crimes that were being committed during the war in Vietnam were neither being acknowledged nor recognized by the powers that be in the Western world. It was basically directed to the rulers of the United States, but also those who were backing them, which meant all the NATO countries, though no one else had troops there apart from the United States, Australia, and South Korea. And we launched that tribunal, investigating teams were sent to North Vietnam to experience the war, myself included. Uh, and we sat through hours and hours of bombing every single day. I saw with my own eyes the day after they'd bombed hospitals and schools in Tanoa province. So it was a, a searing experience which really left its mark on me and made me who I am in many, many ways. And the tribunal was consisted of intellectuals and historians and lawyers from different parts of the world. They met for four weeks in two different sessions after the British Labour government and the French government refused to allow them to meet here, the Swedish Social Democrats under the leadership of Olaf Palme uh, permitted them to meet in Sweden. Interestingly enough, that is where the meetings of the tribunal took place. Witnesses were assembled. The United States was invited to give evidence and refused and said this was a joke. No war crimes were being committed in Vietnam. A few months later, the huge war crime at My Lai, when they wiped out women and children and it was recorded, became public. And the in entire argument against our war crimes tribunal disappeared in a flash in the middle of a tragedy. And the, I, I don't like to say this, but the recently deceased General Colin Powell, uh, who's been you know, subjected to massive praise and effusions in the media, 
was one of the senior officers, not then a general, a colonel, who helped to cover up the My Lai massacre for a long, long time. So criminal enterprises like this are part and parcel of the wars uh, that are waged. Now, Julian exposed another set of wars. Basically, he exposed the so-called war on terror, which began after 9-11, has lasted 20 years, has led to six wars, millions killed, trillions wasted. That is the only balance sheet of that war. Nowhere has it redeemed itself or done any good as we've seen most recently in Afghanistan. So what do you say to people like Chelsea Manning and Julian, who's the principal target of the legal and judicial brutalities taking place, uh, when they reveal stuff which everyone knows it's true, since some of it is on video, Americans bombing Iraqi families, totally innocent, totally innocent, laughing about it, and are recorded killing them. That's a big joke. Well, it isn't a big joke for the millions who've died in the Arab world since these 20 years war began. And Julian, <clears throat> uh, far from being indicted, should actually be a hero. He's not the first, and if they think that punishing him in this vindictive and punitive way is going to change people's attitudes to coming out and telling the truth, they're wrong. They always think this. When we, uh, whistleblowers come out, they thought it when um, one of our colleagues today, Daniel Esberg, blew the whistle on the crimes being committed in Vietnam and revealed secret Pentagon documents, uh, which the New York Times published. Just like the New York Times, the Guardian, El País, Pub uh, Republica published the documents that WikiLeaks released. It wasn't so different. Uh, Edward Snowden did what we know, exposing surveillance hardly remembered but important for Britain was Clive Ponting, a very senior journalist, uh, civil servant at the Ministry of Defense, who exposed the lies on the Falklands War that was being fought. And Clive Ponting was tried mercifully and fortunately for him that it was a jury trial and though the charges were very strong, breach of this, breach of that, uh, the jury acquitted him, so he walked free. Julian is unfortunate to be captured by this particular state and its different apparatuses in order to appease the United States of America. He should never have been kept in prison for bail. He should not be in prison now waiting a trial for extradition. He should be released, and I hope that acts like the Belmarsh Tribunal will help to bring that nearer. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, our next speaker uh, is the former finance minister of Greece, uh, currently a member of the Greek parliament and co-founder of the movement DiEM25, Yanis Varoufakis. Hello, this is Yanis Varoufakis, feeling deeply honored to be part again of the Belmarsh Tribunal. We live in an era when the 1% of the 1% controls the planet, life not just humanity, in a manner that has never been seen before. Never before has so much power, exorbitant power, been concentrated in the hands of so very few who are using it so carelessly and very often with destructive effect. What do you do when you have such a huge concentration of power? We can have a revolution. We can change the world. We are trying to, but that takes a while. In the meantime, how do you control, primarily, the manner in which these supremely powerful forces are controlling what we know, what we see, what we don't know, and what we can't see? A young man in Australia a long, long time ago, <laughs> well before we ever knew about WikiLeaks, had an idea. The idea of using Big Brother's technology to create a large digital kind of mirror 
to turn to the face of Big Brother, so as to enable us to be able to watch him watching us, a bit like turning the mirror to the face of the Medusa. Wikileaks is based on that idea. I remember spending a very long night with Julian in the Ecuadorian embassy in Knightsbridge when he called upon me to help him decipher and transcribe a conversation between officials of the International Monetary Fund. Having spent, in the previous year, a very long time negotiating with them, listening to them on that tape that Julian had procured through Wikileaks, through this blind digital postbox, was such a splendid experience. It was so liberating because I could suddenly hear with my own ears the very same officials effectively agreeing with everything that the good people of Greece were saying, that we were saying, that I had been saying to them. Now, of course, Wikileaks has done far more important work than simply revealing that the International Monetary Fund knew that they were committing crimes against the Greek people and other peoples, Latin America and so on, while perpetrating them. Wikileaks and Julian, as we know, are being persecuted for revealing to the world, especially to liberals, democrats, Tories, social democrats, revealing to them the crimes against humanity perpetrated by our own elected leaders in our name, behind our backs. This is why they are now killing Julian Assange. So our message as the Belmars Tribunal must not simply be one of support for Julian or a call to have him released. No, we are a tribunal. We are trying the criminals that are killing Julian as we speak for crimes against humanity, not just for the crime of slowly murdering Julian Assange. You're criminals and we're going to pursue you to the end of the earth and back for the crimes you're committing all over the world against humanity while also murdering slowly Julian Assange and other whistleblowers who are revealing your crimes. This is our job as the Belmars Tribunal. We must be brave and we must not mince our words. At the same time, we must remember, especially those of us who happen to be white and male, that there are many non-white, non-male whistleblowers out there all over the place, in Africa, in Asia, um, in Latin America, uh, even in the West, whose names we don't even know and who are suffering as we speak, who've been murdered, who've been incarcerated. And we must act on their behalf as well. The Belmarsh Tribunal must act in order to persecute and to prosecute their murderers, their torturers. I'm Yanis Varoufakis, representing DiEM25. I'm in Athens, I wish I were with you. The Belmarsh Tribunal is a serious contribution to international justice to the extent that we continue not to call simply for the release of Julian Assange, which of course we do, but to the extent that we continue to persecute and to prosecute those murderers who are acting on behalf of the 1% of the 1%. Carpe diem. Thanks a lot, Yanis. Uh, we are also very proud to have the next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, the Director of Forensic Architecture and a professor at Goldsmith, uh, Al Weizmann. I'm going to speak about an aspect of uh, the wars of terror of this millennium. And to a great extent, I think that drones embody the, uh, the kind of violence and the paradoxes uh, of this war. And my reference to WikiLeaks contribution is their 2010 revelation. The two years earlier, in 2008, Pakistan approved US drone strikes. Uh, this image that you see is actually part of the leaked Snowden trove, uh, and it shows uh, an Israeli drone uh, intercepted by British secret services. Drone strikes also connect the violence inflicted in the context of Israeli colonial, settler colonial uh, violence in Palestine with first assassinations in 2000, with the imperial wars of terror in, amongst others, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, starting a year or so later. Drone, str drone strikes are interesting also because they are argued as the perfect poison dart, a humanitarian technology allowing for a humanitarian form of violence. 
So their response somehow to those two terms of international law, proportionality, because they're supposed to minimize collateral damage, and distinction, because they're supposed to be, or always argued to be, more precise than they are. So in a sense, I think that I, I chose to speak about drone strikes because they embody the political, an important political and philosophical justification at the heart of the terror wars, and that is the principle of the lesser evil, uh, which leads to that, precisely to those humanitarian wars, just as it led in the past to the civilizing missions of high colonialism. And this is why we should also have a pause and think whether um, the use of human right principle and in international law need to be accepted without reservation. Drone strike also embody another principle confronted by WikiLeaks work, and that is the destruction of evidence and the insistence on deniability. Until tw uh, 2012, eight years into the killing spree along the Pakistan-Afghanistan frontier that began in a much earlier, the CIA could still ni neither confirm or deny using these weapons. And um, what helped this deniability is actually the minuscule evidentiary signature of drone strikes, small holes in a roof that are actually smaller than the pixel size in the satellite images that sometimes we use to look into those areas. So a small missile hole in the ceiling would not be seen in the satellite images. The photographic resolution of those satellite images is actually, are actually made by a political resolution. US law defined the size of the pixels that we see into those places at 50 centimeters, the size of a human from above. In Israel, there is an exception. It's the size of a car from above. It's much bigger pixel. And under that veil of resolution, crimes are actually committed. Uh, so if we look at the, uh, one of the first videos smuggled out of Pakistan, six hands, uh, until it arrived in Islamabad. Compose it together as uh, the group I represent here, Forensic Architecture, 30 of us doing this minuscule evidentiary work on those videos, looking at one of the first documentation of drone strike, marking each one of those shrapnel holes in a wall, in a room in which we know four people were killed, we don't see the human figures unless we, look, unless we look more carefully and actually see that the gaps within the shrapnel create the shadow of those people killed. Those people received the shrapnel in their body and the shadow was inscribed on the wall of that building like a photographic film uh, is, uh, is working. And uh, in a sense, I think that this uh, embody that um, principle in which small-scale munition, in a case of drone strike, and we've exposed and gave evidence to uh, the use of uh, um, those poison dart called the Hellfire Romeo used to strike architecture, that perception of a humanitarian technology is precisely what allowed that violence to proliferate and for strikes to be continued across the entire cities, towns, and villages of Waziristan, such as in, in other places in Yemen, Somalia, and Gaza, so that the greater evil is arrived at cumulatively, um, and, um, and arriving at, at least, for, for only from that type of violence, according to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, 4,000 casualties. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, and it's my honor to present uh, the next speaker, uh, also a member of the UK Parliament, Absana Begum. Thank you, um, It's been long clear that the charges relating to Julian Assange publishing activities must be dropped and that the UK authorities uh, must reject any notion of the extradition to the US, um, and that there must be really an end to the suffering and torture of one person for the simple act of telling the truth. Um, and we know that without a doubt, Julian Assange would face a real risk of serious human rights violations if deported to the US. Um, and in fact, the UK government's conduct in relation to Assange has revealed such gross 
hypocrisy uh, when it comes to any professed commitment to human rights and the rule of law. Um, when just a few weeks ago, it was revealed that only a few years ago, the legal attack on Assange came very close to becoming an actual physical assault, kidnapping, and possibly an, an attempted murder. Now, US lawyers have repeatedly asserted that this is not a political case. Um, and this uh, revelation in the last few weeks shows that it, it absolutely is. And questions are indeed needed to be asked as to the role of British authorities on this and any willingness to participate in this grotesque plan and to participate in potentially gun battles on the streets of London in the pursuit of Assange in, these, in this illegal way. Um, now, if, if Julian is extradited to the US, it will have far-reaching human rights implications and set a chilling precedent. Uh, we know that any such extradition would have profound consequences for press freedom uh, around the world. Um, and this, this really goes to the crux of this issue for many, uh, whether or not we support freedom for journalists um, to publish classified information that is in the public interest. Uh, because as, as has been mentioned already, um, Assange's whistleblowing activities about illegal wars, um, mass murder, murder of civilians and corruption on a grand scale have, have put him where he is now. Um, and many communities across the UK and around the world know this too well. Uh, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were un, unlawful under international law and resulted in large-scale death and destruction, um, and including, as, as uh, the previous speakers mentioned, um, human rights abuses committed on a, on a large scale by occupying troops. Um, the war, those wars have destroyed the lives of so many Iraqis um, and, and people in Afghanistan and caused destruction to the regions, um, but it's also devastated communities in this country as well. Uh, communities such as the Muslim community, um, communities, uh, ethnic minority communities across East London and, and up and down the country. And the consequences are felt to this day. Um, I know in my part of the country and, and in, in the Muslim community, we know too well that um, we must never embark on illegal wars and imperialism abroad. Um, and the, the collateral damage video um, and, and the evidence that uh, WikiLeaks and, and Julian were able to release and provide confirmed to so many of us what we already knew but, and, and what was being done in our names, um, but gave voice, began to give voice to communities to be able to begin to hold governments to account properly as well. Now, since the Iraq war, we've seen extraditions, renditions, um, and, and, and the work of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange helped expose that. But we know our state's actions have helped foster the climate of hostility at home as well. Um, and in the last two decades, we've seen our communities being spied on in our schools, in our mosques, in our universities, and this government's um, uh, approach uh, increasingly uh, being draconian, authoritarian, um, is seeking to strip away the, the, freedom, the freedoms that so many communities hold dear. And we've seen that on clampdowns on dissent, um, particularly in the last 12 months, whether that's been bills such as a spy cops bill or the policing bill trying to curb protest. Um, and so it was, it's in this context it was that, that it's really hard not to understand the appeal against the verdict and, and the verdict earlier this year on extradition as another iteration of the expansion of international state suppression of people and, and the criminalization of journalism. Um, and it was clear that we were misled then and even, and even now the truth continues to be obscured and suppressed. Um, and legislation by successive governments have continued to assault our human rights um, in an even more emboldened way. Um, those that pursue Assange for publishing information about serious human rights violations um, and those responsible for these crimes continue to enjoy impunity. Um, and we, we should never forget that the perpetrators are state actors or agents of the state. And that is why Julian Assange is a threat and other publishers who do the same are a threat. 
they are a part of people trying to hold those in power accountable. And of course, those in power don't like that. Um, and Assange's case is so important to us all because it's about people power versus state power um, and imperialism. And it's about truth versus deceit and cover-ups. And it's about seeking justice in an all too often unjust world. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, our next uh, speaker and member of the Belmar Tribunal is Özlem Demirel, uh, a member of the European Parliament. Dear friends, I'm happy to be with you today, even when the subject we have to talk about is sad. Today, we have to talk about war and war crimes, about the truth and lies. Yes, when we talk about wars in these days, we have to talk about the reasons and justifications for wars. It is European history that has shown the world what armament and militarized competition for markets and resources leads to this First and Second World War. And this is the reason, the real reason, even today for wars. And these reasons were not accepted by the people. So, at the beginning of wars, we have heard other justifications by our governments. It was said that the war on Afghanistan, for example, was about values, human rights or the freedom of women. It was said that, that it was about nation building and democracy. Never it was said that it's about power or, or geopolitical, geopolitical interest. In Iraq, it was said that it's about a dictator and his weapons. Never it was said that it's about oil and economic interests. Even though we surely have no sympathy for these regimes or terrorists, we have to speak out the truth about wars, also from the West. And in this wars, and in all the wars, things are happening that should not happen. When they happen, attempts are made to conceal them. If not already at the beginning of the wars, then at latest hear the role of journalists, whistleblowers and brave ones who speak the truth is very important. The war in Afghanistan was hypocritical. It cost lives, civilian lives. By drones, civilians had been attacked. Human rights violation had been part, not just by the side of the terrorists or Taliban, uh, also of the other side, even on the side of the West and the NATO countries. In Kunduz airstrike, innocent civilians were killed under German command with American air power. To date, neither victims nor relatives have been compensated. On the contrary, it was rejected. Not only in Americans' wars, America's wars, like Afghanistan, also in Mali, where France is the driving force, wedding was turned into a blues bus with drones. Even after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, after the disgusting IS attack, the US killed again innocent children and a family but to rally it is spoken or written about. And this makes independent and critical journalism indispensable. WikiLeaks was an attempt to do this, but Julian Assange has been punished hard for exactly that, and this is not acceptable. If you ask me, war crimes should be in the dark, not journalists whistleblowers who makes the crimes public. Europeans, the, the silence of the European Union in the Assange case is not acceptable for me. They pretend, the European Union pretend to be guided by values and human rights. But could it be the truth regarding the Assange case? No, these are always sacrificed for geopolitical and economical interests. But in the past, present and in the future, there were, there are, there will be 
always the brave ones who speaks all the truths out. And the truth will prevail sooner or later. So we are back uh, to Church House, and our next speaker uh, is a member of the UK Parliament, uh, John McDonald. Thanks a lot for joining the Tribunal. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I'm a member of the UK Parliament, but I'm also in that capacity Secretary of the National Union of Journalists Parliamentary Group within the United Kingdom Parliament. Um, our role as a parliamentary group for the NUJ is to protect and promote the rights of journalists within the United Kingdom and to also link with other parliamentarians across the globe to promote the rights of journalists globally. And we have a long record of interventions and representations opposing attempts wherever to suppress the right of journalists to pursue their profession. At the heart of that profession is the ability to report the truth, to expose wrongs, and in doing so, to enable lessons to be learnt so that those wrongs are redressed and possibly egregious acts prevented in the future. And it's been a, in the United Kingdom at least, it's been a 400 year struggle from the early pamphleteers of the Civil War to now to establish that right. Journalists have sacrificed their liberty and their lives to secure the right to speak truth to power. This is the country of Tom Paine, the author of The Rights of Man, inherent was the freedom of expression to the work he undertook. The chair has already mentioned that we are meeting in the building which has hosted in the past the UK Parliament of also various international bodies who've met to secure the, in law, the protection of human rights, including the freedom of expression. The tragedy is, is that we now have in the United Kingdom a government that is complicit in the persecution of Julian Assange, which has become now a stain on the history of this country and the people's struggle to secure a free media. And he's being persecuted purely and simply for pursuing the profession of journalism and inherent within that whistleblowing. His crime, we need to be absolutely clear, his crime is telling the truth, exposing atrocities of war and the brutality of imperialism. He's been hounded by various states and his life is now his life is now threatened by the very states responsible for the war crimes he exposed. I find it the deepest irony that it is these criminal states that are seeking to criminalize the very person who revealed their criminality and its consequences. I visited Julian Assange in Belmarsh Prison. I believe I'm the only Member of Parliament so far that's been allowed to visit him. He's imprisoned in a high security prison. By all accounts, it is a brutal regime. It's resulted in many harms, self-inflicted amongst the prisoners, including many suicides. I have to say, nobody that endures that regime can do so without having a serious impact upon their health, and their well-being. But I found Julian to be bearing up courageously to the regime under which he's been placed. But let's be clear, this is the punishment of an innocent person. And it has an impact beyond the harm to Julian himself. Again, let us be clear, this is a campaign not just to silence Julian Assange, but as a message to all those other journalists out there globally, all those other whistleblowers, to prevent them coming forward in the future. Why has this tribunal been convened? It because we seek to stand for Julian Assange, to secure his freedom, 
Julian Assange, the journalist, the whistleblower. But we are also in this trial, tribunal, in doing so, making a stand for the fundamental freedom, the freedom of expression, and the fundamental freedom of journalists to pursue their, prof their profession. We stand for fundamental human rights. And if we permit and stand by and allow Julian Assange to be persecu persecuted in this way, have no doubt about it, the fundamental freedoms that we thought had been secured over centuries in the United Kingdom and elsewhere will be at risk. So now we are traveling uh, to the German Bundestag and I'm very honored to have a member of the German parliament with us today, uh, Heike Hensel. Dear friends and colleagues, my name is Heike Hensel. I'm a member of German parliament. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this important event of the Belmarsh Tribunal. The so-called war on terror declared by then President George Bush has now lasted for 20 years. The war in Afghanistan lasted just as long. In Afghanistan, NATO has experienced the greatest defeat in its history. The Afghanistan war, which was launched without a UN mandate, was not only a disaster for NATO, but a big crime against the Afghan people. The Boston University Costs of War project estimates the death toll in Afghanistan and Pakistan at at least 243,000 people, According to a study by the medical organization IPPNW, the number of indirect casualties could be far higher at more than 800,000 dead. More than 4 million people have been forced to flee and Afghanistan remains one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. The German government alone accounts for at least 17.5 billion euros for the war and the US is at over $2 trillion for direct war costs. The parliamentary group Die Linke in the German Bundestag is lobbying for a committee of inquiry in parliament to look into the 20-year Afghanistan mission and also to investigate possible war crimes committed by the NATO troops. For this purpose, the information revealed by WikiLeaks in the Afghan war diaries is invaluable. It is a disgrace for Europe that the journalist and founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, has been locked up innocently in the British high security Belmarsh prison for over two years now, solely to secure his possible extradition to the US, where he faces 175 years in prison for revealing US war crimes. Belmarsh Prison, which has gained additional notoriety from the new James Bond film for its extreme prison conditions, as shown in the film. Those who started the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, violating international law, would have to sit there. Julian Assange must be released immediately and extradition to the US must be prevented. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe already called on member states to do this in January 2020 in a resolution on media freedom after a corresponding amendment was adopted by consensus. Even after Brexit, the UK will remain bound to the European Convention on Human Rights and the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. They guarantee Julian Assange the right to a fair trial and protection from torture and inhuman treatment, which are threatened in the UK currently and especially after extradition to the United States. Consequences must finally be drawn from this resolution. I therefore appeal to the European Union and the German government to protect the rights of Julian Assange, to defend press freedom on European territory and to work for his release, especially in view of new publications about murder plans of the CIA against Julian Assange. This again impressively shows the criminal energy behind the political persecution of Assange. So does the fact that US prosecutors have been using shady board witnesses like Torderson against Julian Assange. Thus, a significant part of the prosecution case also collapses. 
On October 27, 28, therefore, nothing can stand but the immediate release of Julian Assange. Thank you very much. Thank you as well for your contribution to the Belmer Tribunal. Uh, well, I didn't watch the new James Bond movie, uh, but I had the unfortunate, or rather fortune, because he's also my friend, to visit the Belmarsh prison. And just to say for those who still wonder why is the name of our tribunal Belmarsh Tribunal, we named it after the prison where Julian Assange is being held, so that everyone remembers the name of the prison, and so that hopefully he is released soon. Uh, we are coming to our next member of tribunal, who is also a member of the UK Parliament, uh, Richard Bergen. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. From its inception, modern colonialism and imperialism arrived dripping in blood, violence and slaughter. From the wiping out of millions of the original inhabitants of what is now Latin America, to the slave trade and the later carving up of Africa, profit has been squeezed drop by drop out of human suffering. Later, empire took new forms as the United States became the most powerful nation on earth and which Martin Luther King described as, and I quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. A remark he made about the Vietnam War that left millions of Vietnamese dead. But a remark that could have been made about the 2003 Iraq War, which left many, many hundreds of thousands dead. Of course, that war was part of a new era of conquest for oil and control across the Middle East, which 10 years ago also led to the seldom discussed US-led invasion of Libya, which Barack Obama once boasted, deposed a despot at the cost of less than what we spent in two weeks in Iraq. But the human cost, the human cost was much greater for the Libyan people. Libya's human development indices, once the highest in the region, have collapsed. Human trafficking networks thrive in the anarchy as warring factions vie for control of the economy. Slavery markets, slavery markets have appeared where black people are sold to the highest bidder to work in factories. As one account in Time magazine described, by the time his Libyan captors branded his face, Sunday Kabarot had already run away twice and had been sold three times. The gnarled scar that covers most of the left side of his face appears to show a crude number three. His jailer carved it into his cheek with a fire-heated knife, cutting and cauterizing at the same time. This, this is the Libya of 20 21, not 1821. So where are the trials of those who organized these wars, embarked upon as they were with complete contempt for international law? Where is the justice for these victims of 21st century slavery? And today, where is the justice for those being deliberately starved to death in Yemen by that most loyal Western ally, Saudi Arabia. That war has already caused nearly a quarter of a million deaths, and that includes 130,000 deaths from indirect causes such as lack of food as Saudi Arabia uses hunger as a weapon of war alongside the arms sold to them from the West. Yet the United States, despite talk from Biden about breaking with some of Trump and Obama's backing for this Saudi war, still refuses to demand an immediate end to the Saudi blockade of Yemen. And regrettably, Britain, along with the United States, has been involved in too many unjust wars in recent years. Wars of conquest, for control, for oil, much of what we know about these crimes was exposed by the fearless work 
of a journalist whose award-winning journalism was carried out here in Britain. A journalist who was exposed unlawful killing. A journalist who exposed US rendition and the crimes of Guantanamo Bay. A journalist who is now held in a UK high security prison solely because of his journalism. What an indictment of the world that we live in, where those who pursue wars are decorated and celebrated, whilst those who expose war crimes face extradition to the United States and the rest of their life behind bars in a super maximum security prison. The world needs more Julian Assange's. The world needs more Edward Snowden's. The world needs more of the fearless journalism of WikiLeaks. Because, as Julian himself once remarked, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. Uh, our next uh, member of the tribunal uh, is joining from Australia. Uh, he's a former Australian senator, Scott Ludlam. Hi, I'm Scott Ludlam, and I'm speaking to you from Ewan country on the south coast of New South Wales in Australia. I'm honoured to be able to speak at this tribunal today, where collectively we will make clear that the wrong people are being punished for the crimes of the powerful. Events like these allow us to pause and remember the bigger picture. Remember that we're not fighting a single injustice or an individual despot, but something systematic. Today, we hear of the torture camp at Guantanamo Bay. Today, we hear about war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, of white collar crimes in Geneva and Washington DC, unpunished crimes from Nairobi to New York. Speaking of the broadest scope of what he found in the State Department cables, Julian Assange said, that only by approaching this corpus holistically, over and above the documentation of each individual abuse, each localised atrocity, does the true human cost of empire heave into view. So we've come together to speak of the true human cost of empire, and today our eyes are on some of the accomplices who have allowed these abuses to fester in the dark. Anybody who's been following the extradition proceedings against Julian Assange will understand that this is a calculated abuse of the court system, calculated to wear him and his supporters down in an endless cycle of appeals and counter appeals where the prosecution gets what it wants, no matter the result. Because no matter the result, Julian Assange remains in prison, unable to speak for himself. A form of judicial warfare that the UN Special Rapporteur confirmed amounted to torture, all the while seeding the public debate with disinformation and character assassination. Our growing global movement and our presence here today means that this disinformation campaign has failed. Julian's continued defiance from behind the walls of Belmarsh Prison means that this torture campaign has also failed. So this is the first essential step to protecting the right of publishers everywhere to tell the truth about the crimes of the powerful. President Joe Biden, drop the appeal. Julian wrote this to a supporter in 2019. Knowing that you are out there fighting for me keeps me alive in this profound isolation. For us, knowing that he is in there still fighting must be our motivation to bring this campaign to a conclusion so that he can see sunlight for the first time in years and be with his family and his friends and supporters to recover from the harsh cruelty that he has survived and to start the next chapter of his life and work. Free Julian Assange. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we will have a short interlude, uh, which is a sort of evidence. And I invite everyone who is watching us today uh, to closely look at the people who appear in this short video, which we'll show. Some familiar faces from Hillary Clinton to Joe Biden. And then I invite you to look at the people who are with us at the Belmarsh Tribunal. And I invite you to look at the courageous supporters of Julian Assange and other whistleblowers and choose your side. High-tech terrorists. Cyber terrorists. And information terrorism. Shut it down. We're going to hang you. We use a drone or something. A bullet in the brain. Illegally shoot the son of a 
Uh, information warfare is warfare. And Julian Assange is engaged in warfare. Information terrorism, which leads to people getting killed, is terrorism. And Julian Assange is engaged in terrorism. He should be treated as an enemy combatant. WikiLeaks should be closed down permanently and decisively. Should the United States do something to stop Mr. Assange? We're looking at that right now. The Justice Department is taking a look at that. I would argue that it's closer to being a high-tech terrorist than the, than the Pentagon Papers. This disclosure is not just an attack on America's foreign policy interests. It is an attack on the international community. The, the, the head of WikiLeaks is not a particularly credible source in my mind. He's, he is a, you know, to me, in my mind, he's a, he's a criminal and he ought to be hunted down and grabbed and, and put on trial for what he has done here. I think the man is a high-tech terrorist. Um, he's done in Assange. Yeah. He needs to be prosecuted to the full, fullest extent of the law, and if that becomes a problem, we need to change the law. Well, I think Assange should be assassinated, actually. I think Obama should put out a contract and maybe use a drone or something. You don't want to act panicked and have the Well, you don't have to act panicked. You can act tough and say, if we catch you, we're going to hang you. Yeah. Well, or whatever. We heard some of that from Holder. Julian Assange is a cyber terrorist in wartime. He's guilty of sabotage, espionage, crimes against humanity. He should be killed. How is it? How is it that the WikiLeaks guy remains free? You know, back in the old days when men were men and countries were countries, this guy would die of lead poisoning from a bullet in the brain, and nobody would know who put it there. The way to deal with this is pretty simple. We got special ops forces. I mean, a, a dead man can't leak stuff. This guy's a traitor, a treasonous, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I only want to do it, illegally shoot the son of a it's time that the Obama administration treats WikiLeaks for what it is, a terrorist organization whose continued operations threatens our security. Shut it down. Shut it down. It is time to shut down this terrorist organization, this terrorist website, WikiLeaks. Shut it down, Attorney General Holder.